If you would recall, we've been looking at uh, limits and building an intuition about how limits work. And we also introduced the concept of continuity. We, want, we also introduced the definition of a limit, which is not as helpful for building an intuition around limits. Yesterday, uh, we looked at the concept of continuity and how it relates to limits and how visually we can see when a function is continuous or not. Today, we want to take what we know about continuous functions and combine that with uh, looking at calculating limits uh, using algebraic techniques. So we've talked about it from a graphical standpoint. Now we wanna talk about it from an algebraic standpoint. So this problem is, uh, may look familiar to you if you've gotten to this point in the homework. This is chapter one, section nine, problem two. You'll have a problem similar to this. There'll be a five over X minus one over X minus five. And we care about the limit as X approaches five. So other variations of this problem would be seven over X minus one all over X minus seven and find the limit as X approaches seven. So this problem, this version of the problem were brought to you by the number five. Here's what we wanna point out. If the function were continuous at X equals five, we can evaluate the limit just by plugging five into the function. Recall that if f of x is continuous, if a function f of x is continuous at some point x equals c, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. So this is how we defined continuity. Remember there were three aspects to be for a function to be continuous at a point. First, the function needs to be defined at that point. Second, the limit of the function as x approaches that point needs to exist. And third, those two values need to be the same. So there were three things contained in this definition of continuity. What we notice about the function at hand is that I can't just plug five into the function. We'll end up dividing by zero. And we're not allowed to do that. That would give us something undefined. And we don't know what division by zero is gonna tell us in this case. Sometimes we divide by zero and we end up with infinity. Sometimes we end up with zero. Sometimes we end up with negative infinity. Sometimes we end up with anything in between. That's why we cannot define division by zero. Just wouldn't tell us anything. So we need to come up with some alternate strategies to just plugging stuff in when we have functions that are not continuous at points. We want to plug in x equals five, but we can't because we'll end up dividing by zero. So we are going to, we can plug in values of x that are close to five. We can't plug in five but we can plug in X that are close to five. We can't plug in five, but we can plug in values of X that are close to five. So let's do that. Let's plug in values of X that are close to five. I'm just gonna call this function F of X. So I'm just gonna label this function up here F of X. Now, 
Now, we could also look at a graph, but looking at a graph is just plugging in lots of values at once. So I'm gonna grab my calculator so I can plug in some values. And I'm going to enter this function, making sure that I get all my parentheses in place. Since five is being divided by X and then we're subtracting one, I don't need parentheses around the five minus X. Multiplication and division go before subtraction. However, I do need to calculate five over X minus one before I divide by X minus five. So I'll need parentheses around the numerator. Also, I'll need parentheses around the denominator because I'm dividing by the difference of X and five. So I make sure I got my numerator in parentheses, my denominator in parentheses. I don't need parentheses around five divided by X because that division will happen before subtracting one. Let's take a look at the graph of this function. And we'll see that we can't evaluate the function at five. So if I try to trace it and plug in the number five, I get nothing for y. So it's hard to see uh, from this on this resolution in this calculator, but one of the reasons I picked the TI-84, if it will focus, is that it shows that there's a hole in the graph at five. So if I try to trace, I, got, I can plug in 5.1 and 4.9, but I can't plug in five. So we're gonna plug in values that are close to five. I'm gonna try those two values. I can just trace to them. So when X is 4.9, I get negative 0 0.204. So when X is 4.9, I get negative 0 0.20, I spelled zero wrong. And so that's when we plug in 4.9. If I tr try to plug in 4.99, that's closer to five. That's an X that's closer to five. I get negative 0 0.2004. And I'll try one more. I'll try to plug in 4.999 and that'll get me at negative 0 0.2004. Once again, we can't plug in five, so we plug in values of X that are close to five and see where things are headed. What we're trying to figure out is as the X approaches five, where is the function headed? And if I try one more, uh, 4.9999, I get negative two point, one more zero in between the two and the four. So it looks like, at this point, maybe we'll speculate. It looks like, this is headed towards negative 0 0.2. This is speculation, so 0 0.2 maybe. And we'll kind of like this because 0.2 is one fifth. And then we can try approaching the five from the other side. So if I try plug in 5.1, I get negative 0.196. And then 5.01, I get negative 0.1996. And then 5.001. And it looks like I'm just point a bunch of zeros and a four away from the negative 0.2, which with all these fives running around, maybe is gonna suggest that we're headed towards negative 0.2 because that's negative one fifth. More zeros before the one, we even get closer to negative 0.2. So one way we can try to uh, evaluate a limit is by plugging in values that are close to five. K 
can't plug in five, so plug in things close to five and then speculate. Can't be afraid to guess. It's the only way we've ever learned anything. If you learn something because someone told you, before that, someone was guessing. At some point in that line, someone was just guessing. Or just deciding. At a certain point, we just decided that this is two. We're gonna call that two. All over the world, we use different words, but we all agree that we should have a word that's consistent through our, our language that that is two. So one way we can go about the problem is taking a numeric approach. Pl can't plug in five, so plug in things that are close to five and then speculate and try to figure out where things are headed. So this is an approach using numbers. One of the things that we may notice about this function, five over x minus one over x minus five, is that this expression is not simplified. Maybe we could hammer on this expression a little bit and get a better idea, a simplified version of this function. So let's look at an algebraic approach. So I'm just gonna isolate the function itself, five over x minus one, all over x minus five. And I'm gonna to try to start to simplify this expression. I notice I have a complex fraction. The numerator is five over x minus one and the denominator is an x minus five. There are a couple of things that we can do. We could simplify the numerator. I've got a fraction up there. Let's add those fractions. So maybe this is what we do. I'm gonna take five over X and I'll get a common denominator by turning one into X over X. Now X over X is not equal to one when X is zero, but since I've got five over X here, X better not be zero. So right away in this expression, X can't be zero and X can't be five. So it's okay to write X over X. X is not gonna be zero in this problem. Let's make a note of that. Note, for this ex in this expression right here, whatever happens at the other end, X can't be zero and X cannot be five. That's why we're doing this in the first place, that X can't be five parts. So now my numerator is five minus X over X. And my denominator is x minus five. So I'm gonna divide these fractions. I'm gonna say this is five minus x over x times one over x minus five. If you're dividing by something, you are multiplying by its reciprocal. In this expression here, we still have the restrictions. X can't be zero and x equals five, but it's super obvious that x can't be zero and x can't be five. However, we're about to lose a piece of information because we notice in the numerator, we've got a five minus X and in the denominator, we've got an X minus five and those are opposites. Five minus X divided by X minus five is equal to negative one. So when we simplify this expression, we get negative one over X because five minus X divided by X minus five is equal to negative one. Um, professor, yes. how did you get five over X minus X over X? Uh, I'm just trying to add these two fractions up here, five over X um, by getting a common denominator. So I wrote one as X over X. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. 
One is not equal to x over x when x is equal to zero, but x can't be zero in this problem. So now over here, we can still see that x can't be zero, but we have lost a piece of information that x can't be five. So this, this, this original function is equal to negative one over x, but only when x isn't five. So we have to note that x can't be zero, that's still obvious. But we have to remember that x can't be five as well because we've lost that piece of information. How did you get negative one? I have five minus X divided by X minus five. Those will always be opposites. So if we just pick a number five minus two, if we do something like five minus two, that's gonna be three, but two minus five will be negative three. Those will always be opposites of each other. So when we divide them, we'll always get negative one. So the point is that this, the, this original function is equal to negative one over x, so long as x is not five. But we only care about the limit as x approaches five. And the function negative one over x uh, is defined when x equals five. So since we're only dealing with x that is that are close to five, this is why our algebra approach is going to pay off. Since uh, we're calculating a limit, we're only plugging in values of x that are close to 5. We're not plugging in 5. just values that are close to five. What that means is that I can replace the five over X minus one over X minus five with negative one over X. So I can calculate the limits as X approaches five of five over X minus one over X minus five, I can replace my function where I can't plug in five with a function that's equivalent everywhere but five and then plug in the five. In algebra class, for the most part, we just kept saying that these two things are equal. This is the simplified form of what we started with. But that's because in algebra, when we were doing this, we were practicing these maneuvers. We were practicing how to get from one, from this function to this simplified function. But these two are only equal when X is not five. However, since we're calculating a limit, really we're just plugging in things that are close to five. So I'm gonna put the five into this, uh, the simplified version and get negative one fifth. So if I go back to my calculating machine and I turn off this function and turn on the function negative one over X, in this function, I can plug in five and we come up with negative 0.2. So if I turn both functions on, and try to trace at five, it's undefined on y1, the original function, but I can plug in five to negative one over x, the simplified function. 
Everywhere else, the values are the same. But here at this point five, they are not. So we can take an algebraic approach to calculating limits. Even though these two expressions are not equal when x equals five, I'm only concerned with what's going on when x is approaching five. And then I can use the fact that negative one over x is continuous at five so that I can plug in. Any questions? We want to just plug things in because that's easiest. So we either plug in, plug things in that are close to five, or we do some algebra to get a simplified version of the function and then plug in five. Um, professor? Yes. So when we encounter questions like this that requires us to utilize algebra methods, is there like a way to like, I guess, identify like how we should approach a certain problem? Um, really the only way to know is to have done thousands of algebra problems and know what your options are. So uh, that's, that's, that's kind of the best way to do it. Um, if you come up with like a flow chart for what you see in the function, it just gets unreasonable very fast. The best way to do this is to uh, get your algebra skills to the point where they are second nature. And when you see an expression, you, know, you kind of know the things that you can do to rewrite the expression. That's not a very satisfying answer. Uh, that's like in video games when you're like, oh man, how do I get past this one boss? And then someone responds, get good. That's, that's not helpful. But um, the best thing to do is to practice and improve your skills. Experience and intuition. That, that's kind of the things that we need to go for. Because when you're faced with a problem like this, this, this problem is completely different. In an algebra class, I would give you this expression and I would say simplify like this expression because we have just been doing this a bunch on the homework. And then so the quiz shows up, I'm like, I'll simplify this expression. You're like, oh, no problem. We just did a bunch of this. But now we have to take that skill and do that skill in context. So we have to see this expression and know that we can do this procedure. We have to know that that's an option. So I wish it was just as simple as what you need to do is get um, a better keyboard and mouse and then you'll start winning, but you just have to know. Which function? The original function is not continuous at five. The so it's not whether the function is continuous because the original function is not continuous at zero and not continuous at five. It's continuous. It's continuous everywhere else. Continuous is a description that happens at a point. So we don't just say something is continuous or not continuous, especially when we're down in the nitty gritty looking at specific values of X. So this is not the only thing that we could have done on this particular problem, but it all works out to this in, um, eventually. He's a very big dog. He is this dog in particular. His name is Colson. He's 120 pounds of Rottweiler. And there's a delivery truck out on the street and he has to make sure that the delivery truck guy does not come in and murder us all. The delivery has ill intent. Yes, the delivery might have ill intent, so. As beefy and big as he is, he is not the absolute unit of Rottweilers that I've seen. So we uh, used to show him and there are other Rottweilers out there that are absolutely even more unit than he is. 
let's take a look at some other options for this um, or other things that we need to be aware of. As far as an apocalypse dog, it depends on the apocalypse. If it's an apocalypse where you have to be really quiet all the time, not a good choice because dogs, we programmed dogs with this barking response. That's why I don't get mad at him when he starts barking at stuff. It's like literally his job. It's genetically his job to be aware of his surroundings and warn me when something weird comes along. We asked him to do that. So it would be unreasonable for me to be like, oh, stop doing your genetically programmed job. So if it's like a quiet place, um, man, I, I don't know. I'd have to find like a very well insulated place where we can't hear stuff on the outside. Cause he, he'd hear one of those things walking around or just some other survivors walk around and just start barking. All right, so what are we talking about? Let's see. I'm gonna pick one at random. So once again, following the theme of, you'll just have to know. This might also look familiar as part of, the pro of one of your problems. Um, now the prescribed method that the book wants you, the, the problem the, in the book wants you to use is a little bit strange. I see what they're going for here, but that's not something that we can, that's generally applicable necessarily, unless we can actually see where this problem comes from. If you've been through calculus before, you say, this is the difference quotient for the derivative. We're finding the derivative of the square root of X when X is equal to seven but that might not be readily available. Here's what we do notice. We can't plug in zero because of this H down here, because this, fu this function up here is not continuous when H is equal to zero. But as we saw in that last problem, if I could somehow cancel this factor of H down in the denominator, then I would be able to plug in zero. So I can't um, plug in zero in this form, Remember, that's what we want to do. I want to evaluate limits just by plugging stuff in. I want stuff to be continuous so that I can do that. But here we can't plug in zero. Because of the zero denominator. However, if we can out, uh, somehow cancel out that H, if we can manipulate this algebraically and cancel out the H, then we can plug in zero. So let's try to, so let's do some algebra. That will cancel that zero. Or sorry, cancel the H in the denominator. Now, once again, this comes down to a matter of experience. In your algebra classes, you may have been taught this thing called rationalizing denominators. We're not gonna rationalize the denominator in this case, but we are gonna use the rationalize the denominator technique. So here's what we're going to do. I'm gonna take this expression I'm going to say the square root of 49 minus h, or sorry, 49 plus h, and subtract 7 all over h. And I'm going to rationalize the numerator. This is not something that, this is not, is probably not something that you've done before. Because before we said we don't want uh, radicals in the denominator for reasons. And so you learn to rationalize the denominator. And then your instructor further rationalized that, that process by saying we can't have square roots in the denominator. Meanwhile, we grab a calculator and we're like, oh, we totally can. What's the problem here? 
So here's what we're going to do. Um, I can't just take the square root. That'll change the whole value of the function. I can't just replace the function I don't like with the function that I do like. But I can do the classic mathematical tricks. Add zero, multiply by one, change my variables. I'm gonna use the second option. I'm gonna multiply by one. I'm gonna multiply by something over something else. And it's going to be the square root of 49 plus h plus seven on the top and the bottom. I'm not changing the value. I just multiplied by one. That won't change the value of my function. However, it changes a lot as far as the form goes. In the numerator, I have essentially a minus b times a plus b. I see I have an a minus b, and then over here I have an a plus b. And I know that if I multiply those two things, which is what we're doing, I will end up with a squared plus b squared. Oh, sorry, a squared minus b squared. Because we just FOIL, just multiply. First, outer, inner, last. So I'm going to have 49 plus h times a uh, square root of 49 plus h times another square root of 49 plus h. So that's going to be a square root of 49 plus, uh, plus h squared. I'll have plus seven square roots of 49 minus h, minus seven square roots of 49 minus h, and those cancel. And then we'll have minus 49. The denominator has the h that I'm trying to get rid of because I want to just plug in zero. Can't yet because that h is still there. And that h is being multiplied by the square root of 49 plus h, plus seven. The question that we, that's gonna come up right now is, how would we think to do this? How would we know that this is what we're supposed to do? And the answer is, after 20 years and thousands of problems, you'll just know. It's not about knowing, about being able to do some things when prescribed, it's about knowing what you can do and when those things will help. Let's take a look at why this helps. Here we have the square root of 49 plus h squared. So I just have 49 plus h. So this simplifies to 49 plus h minus 49. My denominator is still my denominator, h times the square root of 49 plus h plus seven. We're still just dealing with simplifying, rationalizing the numerator, which is not something we probably have done before. Here's the benefits. We have a 49 minus a 49, those cancel out. So now I get to get rid of the 49s. And this is why that's good. Candlestick Park was kind of an eyesore and you know, there's better weather in Santa Clara. Oh, that's getting rid of the 49ers. So this is just getting rid of a 49, my apologies. The numerator is an H and the denominator is H times the square root of 49 plus H uh, plus seven. And now we've accomplished what we want to accomplish in the first place. We did some algebra and now we can cancel the H. So my expression looks like one over the square root of 49 plus H plus seven 
we've made progress because in this expression, we still got an H in the denominator, but we're adding 49 to it and then taking the square root. So we can plug H equals zero into this expression. So we'll take the limit as H goes to zero of the square root of 49 plus H minus seven over H. This is equal to the limit as H goes to zero of one over the square root of 49 plus H plus seven. And here we can plug into in zero. This is the same thing that we did in the last problem. I couldn't plug the five in because there was an X minus five in the denominator. So I cancel that X minus five out and then I get to plug in five. It's the same thing that we did here. I can't plug in zero because of the H in the denominator. Once I cancel out the H in the denominator, I can plug in zero. And so away we go. For, uh, square root of 49 plus zero is square root of 49. Square root of 49 is seven, seven and seven is 14. So we get a limit of one over 14. Let's verify this graphically. Let's get rid of these two functions. And let's put this original function. I have, let's see, I need new, the numerator is the square root of 49, plus, I'm gonna use X for H, minus seven, close the numerator, divide by the denominator, which is just X. We can see that we just have very small values. So I'm gonna change my window. I'm gonna divide these all by four, see if that gives us a little bit better. I'm gonna change the, I'm gonna cut the Y in a quarter. There, we get a little bit more. Now let's compare this to the function. One over the square root of 49, plus H plus seven. And we can see that this graph shows up exactly on top of the other one. The difference is when I trace the second graph, Y4, I get to plug in zero and it's 0 0.07142857. Which is a half of a seventh, because I recognize those digits one, four, two, eight, five, seven. So it looks like we were right on the uh, that, that this process worked. We did some algebra to get down to the one fourteenth. The trick was how do we know to do this particular algebraic maneuver? The answer is we'll just know. Eventually, you'll just know. Algebra will become so second nature, you'll just know what you can do. So you'll know how to improvise. Usually when we're doing an algebra class, I say you're gonna be doing this specific maneuver when you see a specific function, when you have to rationalize the denominator with more, a radical and more than one term. But we only learn a few tricks and tips when we're taking algebra. So you can only rationalize kind of a few things. Any questions? Uh, professor? Yes. How come for the first example, um, when you can't plug in like five in the original one, and then you can't plug it into like the simplified one. 
but then for the second one, if you can't plug in zero to the original, but then you can plug in zero to like the simplified. When we're calculating a limit, we're not plugging in zero, we're plugging in values that are close to zero to see where the function is headed. So this original expression with the over h part mm -hmm. and this second expression are equal everywhere but zero. So if I want to know where this function is headed when h is equal to zero, I can look at this simplified function when h is equal to zero. The advantage here is that I can actually plug zero into this function. Because these two are, are equal everywhere but zero. And when we're calculating a limit, we're really only concerned with what's happening as h approaches zero. Oh, okay. That's Thank why that, this technique of canceling out the h is so effective. Because we're looking at values, uh, when we're taking the limit as h goes to zero, we're only looking at values of h that are close to zero, not equal to zero. And we're cheating a little bit because the second one is going the same place as the first one, but we can plug in zero. That's the power of algebra. How's everybody okay? This is one of the things that makes calculus difficult is all the algebra involved. The hardest part of calculus is all the algebra that's involved. And the main reason that the algebra makes calculus difficult is that it gets in the way of our understanding of calculus ideas. So a lot of times we want to explain an idea in math and then use an example to illustrate that idea. Those examples are going to be littered with algebra all over the place. And when you have students that just go right from algebra and then do geometry and then algebra again and then pre-calculus, they're in a calculus class. The assumption is that you remember all your algebra, but you don't remember all your algebra to the degree that would make it helpful in a calculus class. That make sense? Um, I got a question. Yes. After you canceled out the H's, how did you get the one on top? I divided the top and bottom by one. So H divided by H is equal to one. There's oh. an H in the numerator and an H in the denominator. Really what we're looking at in this is we have, let's say two over 10. And then the 10 is a two times five. So I have a two over two times five, I canceled out the twos and was left with one fifth. But instead of a two, it was an H. And instead of a five, it was a square root of 49 plus H plus seven. Oh, okay, thank you. Any other questions? I joke a lot with my uh, calculus students that the hardest part is going to be the algebra. And the, one of the biggest difficulties is that um, you're underprepared in your, al your algebra skills are not really where they need to be. Um, a lot of you probably got A's in your algebra class, but that does not necessarily mean that you are well prepared for algebra. And one of the other things that goes along with this is that the system that we have with prerequisites where you take one class and move on to the next one is completely unfair the way we set it up. Because we take the prerequisite class, students need to learn algebra so that we can talk about calculus. But we don't really require that you have like an awesome set of algebra skills before we just dump you in a calculus class. Part of this is practical. There is no way we're gonna give you an algebra class and set up a bunch of awesome algebra skills where that the algebra is to a point where you don't need to think about it in calculus. If we were gonna do that, we'd be spending way too much time playing the algebra game before we just moved on to the calculus game. That makes sense? That would be like, suppose we had Shaquille O'Neal and he's ready to play in the NBA, uh, like at the start of his career, and so I go, I'm sorry, Shaq, but you can't progress to the NBA until you get this free throw thing solved. 
once you're going to reliably hit 90% of your free throws, then you can play in the NBA. If that was the case, if, if the NBA treated that at, treated these out, basketball skills as a prerequisite for being in the NBA, look what we would have missed out on. We would have missed out on Shaq's whole career and no one thinks that's a good idea. Dude's a national treasure. He's uh, one of the greats, uh, all-time greats of basketball. So we look at this free throw thing. I'm like, well, you know what? We're going to let that slide because he's really good at every other aspect of the game. Make sense? All right. So we take algebra skills and we get you to the point where you have reasonable algebra skills, and then we're just gonna have to reinforce them later. Some pitchers are major league prospects and they don't have a curveball. Not a good one, not a major league one, but we say they've got other skills. They can put their fastball anywhere they want it and they have a decent changeup. We can work with that. We'll build the rest of it. And sometimes we'll just say, well, this dude can hit, but he can't do any other thing. So we'll make him a designated hitter. We got a job for that. You know what I mean? I've never met Shaquille O'Neal, uh, but he seems like a really cool dude. I mean, you watch him in interviews. He seems really funny and smart. So I don't know. Maybe you have a different opinion. I don't know. I don't know what he's really like. Hey, Professor, I have a question that's completely unrelated to math. Uh huh. But um, how does Dungeons and Dragons work? Yeah. So Dungeons and Dragons is just a. Uh, it's like a like a, a an RPG video game, but instead of some stupid computer being in charge of what happens next, there's a human in charge, and they can decide what you can do. It's also better because um, think of all the times that you're running along in a video game and you come across a fence that's only three feet high and you can't get over it. Your character's just like running and they don't just hop the fence or you have to just push a button. In D&D, &D, you don't worry about that kind of stuff. So, um, it's like a video game, but the handcuffs are off. You can do whatever it is that you want. And then there's a human in charge of, because there's a human coming up with your solutions. So ultimately it comes down to communal storytelling. You and a group of, the dungeon master sets up a situation and the players pretending to be these characters act like those characters would act. And then you pretend you're in a movie. But wouldn't they create like a character that's so overpowered? Uh, they don't get to. There are rules for what your character can and can't do. So you that's don't just get to say that uh, I super cyan the whole thing. So you just can't do that. Not until higher level. Interesting. So any other questions? All right. So if you get stuck on a problem, um, you got to jump back into your algebra and try to think what algebra things can I do that involve these kinds of set setups? I got a rational function. What kind of algebra do I know about rational functions? I got a square root. What kind of stuff do I know about square roots? I've got a trig function. What do I remember about trig functions? All right, that's gonna do it for today. Uh, we'll have our first sign off if there are any other questions. Uh, you can ask me after the first sign off. That's it for today. Um, everybody have a good weekend. If you have a question and you'd like a face-to-face -face meeting for, in office hours tomorrow, make sure you send me an email. I won't just be hanging out on Zoom. Uh, so send me an email if you have a question that you want to go over face-to-face -face that we can't solve in email. That's it for today. I'll see you all on Monday. Everybody have a good weekend and thanks for playing.